Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Christ Church in Norristown. For those of you who are here in person with us this morning, a warm greeting on this cold winter morning. Um, and we're happy to have you with us, brave souls that you are. Uh, greetings to our friends who are joining us on Facebook and our members who have uh, religiously uh, signed in and shared their greetings each Sunday as they, as they joined us. Welcome to you this morning as well. It's always a pleasure for me to be the worship leader. It's a great day to be uh, in the house of the Lord, and, and I always take, take pleasure and, and joy uh, from it. Today actually is about a one year since we've had our last uh, uh, service with Pastor Jeff. Uh, and I wanted to tell you that uh, from the consistory and from myself, uh, we all appreciate all of the work and efforts that all of us have done to uh, continue uh, to be a faith community uh, to each other as well as to the, the, local, the local area. Uh, the church is alive and well. Uh, we are doing uh, God's work and, and will continue to do so. Um, I'm happy to tell you that we are continuing to receive profiles uh, from the conference on potential uh, pastors and our, your search committee reviews those diligently and has uh, discussions uh, ongoing. Um, to date we have interviewed two pa uh, potential pastors um, and so the work is, is continuing and uh, it is encouraging uh, as, as we move into 2022. Uh, these are not easy tasks and they don't happen overnight. Um, and so we're grateful for uh, the work that the search committee is, is performing and doing. And uh, we're grateful for the opportunity to meet and greet and learn uh, about the, uh, the potential pastors who are coming, coming uh, our way. Hopefully we'll have some answers and some uh, recommendations for you in the very, very near future. We're also grateful that we continue with the many ministries that Christ Church has always been involved with. Um, we are continuing with our blanket ministry uh, that has been very successful and we appreciate the contributions uh, financially that uh, members have given us uh, and, and uh, those blankets are making their way into the community uh, and we do appreciate those who uh, have taken the time and made the efforts to deliver them. So thank you. Uh, United Fellowship continues to, to gain some, some steam. We are taking a little bit of time off in February and we'll resume in, in, in March. Uh, we'll welcome those who have been attending and encourage those who might be considering to, uh, to come on out in, in beginning in March. We did begin a new clothing ministry here with Interfaith uh, here in Christ Church on Thursdays. Uh, we're open to, to the community and, and uh, we're grateful to Susan Giuliano who's leading that effort and, and uh, for the folks from Community Interfaith who are using our building uh, to provide uh, an opportunity for those to come in and uh, kind of root through what, what we have uh, uh, very nicely and I might, might add very nicely displayed uh, in, in the first floor of, 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 the, of the church sanctuary. We thank Carol Couch for the continuing of the card ministry and those who are, are uh, having birthdays and anniversaries and celebrations. Uh, you, should, uh, we, you should be receiving greetings from Christ Church and we do thank, thank Carol, Carol for that. I know it's a little uh, cold and wintry, but we continue with the little library out front. So uh, we're grateful to those who uh, maintain that and monitor that. And I know that uh, uh, it is being used uh, as, as, uh, as frequently as um, weekly. So it's a nice, a nice gesture and a nice opportunity for, for us. Remind you that, that uh, the last day for uh, collecting perishables for Super Sunday, Super Bowl Sunday is, is next Sunday. So if you have items that you'd like to donate to the church, please bring them in. If you 
you need us to pick them up, please call the church and we can come and, and uh, uh, pick them up, pick, pick them up from you. We continue with our uh, Bible, Bible study on Tuesday evenings with Mark Dooley. Uh, we're always uh, eager and anxious for new folks to join us. Uh, I know that uh, it's a spirited group and a lively group, so uh, you're more than welcome to, uh, to tune in and, and join in, uh, join in with uh, the group that meets on Tuesday evenings. This month we're recognizing the uh, Jefferson, uh, Jefferson Apartments, Christian Concern, uh, through, through our benevolent giving. Um, and so uh, please mark your envelopes or use your uh, online giving to uh, designate your funds for, for that. So again, it's an active, uh, it's an active uh, church, it's an active uh, community response, and we're grateful to all that are participating. And we encourage those of you who are standing on the sideline and looking for something to do, uh, please, please join us. And my final announcement is uh, the annual meeting will be held on February 27th here at Christ Church. Uh, it's in person, and we're encouraging as many of you to join us on that day as possible. Uh, we will have a Zoom for those of you who can't uh, get out, uh, but would still like to be with us, and a uh, call-in number for you as well. And then after the meeting, we'll enjoy some fellowship and, and a luncheon downstairs in Nailer in, in Hall. Um, and uh, greet and meet and talk and just, just in general, uh, be, be together in Jacob. At this time, please join me in the call of worship. Please rise. In you, O oh God, we take refuge and know we will never feel the shame for it. In your righteousness, save us to be our rock that will shield and protect us. You have been our hope and trust since we were children. Therefore, we will continue to praise you throughout our lives. You have been a rock that will hold firm even when we have lost our way. We gather this day to remember your love and grace toward us. And are very grateful for this time together. Our invocation. O oh God, be our guide as we find pleasure in your presence and the presence of this precious community today. May we be refreshed and reminded of how love can change lives and bring hope to people who have forgotten to hope. May we share love with people who have not known love or joy for a long time. May we, new, may, we, may we learn new ways to love our neighbors and ourselves that we may truly present with others in Jesus' name.
It is our God who comes to us in glory and in the quiet of our hearts, to whom we now bring our confession. O oh God, we confess that each day we intend to live a life of loving service, kindness, and care. We find that we often fall short when faced with the stress of our job, school, living with our neighbors, we act in ways that do not reflect our faith. Words slip past our lips we know we should not have said. We listen to voices that preach hate and fear of the other. We set a joyous sign so we can seek vengeance. We make assumptions about the worth of people we think are not like ourselves, then act toward them based on those assumptions. Forgive us, O oh God. Fill us with your grace. Not so we can see ourselves as superior to our neighbor, but that we may truly love and forgive our neighbor, share joy, and allow ourselves to know love and care. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Savior and God. Amen. Brothers and sisters, our calling is hard and failing great, yet our loving parent, God, lifts us each up, forgives us, and gives us the strength to move forward with love into the world. Let us accept God's forgiveness and strength and courage that we may go forth from this place this day to face the new week, the challenges, knowing that we are loved by God. Amen. Amen.
second reading this morning comes from Luke chapter 4, verses 14 through 21. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote me to this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do here also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did in Chapernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in his prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah. When the heaven was shut up for three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all of the land, that Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow and set fire in Sodom. There there were also leopards in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman, the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to, throw, <clears throat> to the throne of the hill on which their town was built. So they might have hurt, they might have hurled him off the cliff, but he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. Here ends the reading of this morning's scriptures. May God add his blessing upon them. May what I say and what you hear be in the name of God. If I speak with the tongues of mortals and of angels and have not love, I am a sounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Wow, those are pretty powerful, profound words to say. And one wonders what was going on in Corinth that Paul spoke so boldly and so forthrightly to the people living in Corinth. Pretty amazing things that Paul is talking about. And what's interesting to me is that he makes it first person. He says, if I speak, if I have, if I give away, which is basically saying, it's me, it could be me. It's kind of like that personal hypothetical. And so he's trying really hard not to chastise the people of Corinth too much, but you know something must have been going on. Probably someone was speaking out of turn, maybe uh, rather loudly, and may not have had what the people of Corinth would have considered a loving personality, perhaps. And Paul was trying really hard to remind the people of Corinth and to remind us also that Jesus expected followers to have love and to live it on a regular basis, that it should be part of our religious experience all the way from the beginning to the end. And yet there was some kind of dysfunction going on in Corinth, probably due in some way, at least the people of Corinth may have contacted Paul, may have been trying to let him know that they thought it was very likely due to a lack of love or a lack of understanding among the people. And you keep wondering, okay, so, so how is it that people do learn love? How do we recognize what, what love is or what it isn't? Now, it's really hard to define an emotion. I mean, though it's a strong something, it, it causes us to, to act in certain ways, to think in certain ways, but we don't always really know what it is and what it isn't specifically. So basically Paul says some things about how we can recognize if what we're feeling might be love. So he tells us it's patient, it's kind, it rejoices in the truth. You know, you remember all these from having just heard them. 
It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, and never ends. That's a lot to put on one emotion, but that's what we, we do, and that's what we're encouraged to think about when love is part of what's happening in our lives. But then we also get the other side, what love is not, how you can tell if love is not happening. It's not jealous, it's not boastful, or arrogant, or rude, or selfish, or irritable, or resentful, and it does not rejoice in wrongdoing. And so it gives us a little bit of an idea of what baby love is and love isn't, some little guidelines to take us through. And we also can tell by all of those that it's really tricky. It is really hard to know just what we're feeling is all of those things, because when we're in the midst of a strong emotion, it's really hard to say, wait a minute, is it patient, is it kind? Uh, but we can ask ourselves some of the big things, like, is it causing me to do something that is really wrong, that's painful, that's harmful? Because we hear a lot of that, well, I did that because I love you. Well, it only, I only hurt you because I love you. Hmm, Paul would not have gone along with that one. And yet a lot of us do. Where is it we learn to love? We learn it from our family, our community of faith, the community at large. We also learn it from friends when we start school. We learn it on the job. We learn it in so many other places. And the challenge is, if love is missing in any of those places, two, let's say two of those places, it's possible that the other places can fill it in for us and help us to get the love piece that we really, really need. But if it's lacking in war, it's really hard. And sometimes people need to rescue children and other people from situations where there is no love. It's a really challenging thing to do. But love is that important. I can't help but wonder what was going on in Nazareth the day Jesus was reading from the scripture. At first people marveled, wow, what, wow, that's amazing, all that stuff. Uh, and, it, and the scriptures fulfilled in our hearing, that's amazing. And then Jesus tried to describe how he is not going to be seen as a prophet in his own town, which he understood because it had happened in the past. And then the people of Nazareth went to prove that he was right. So here they were, marveling, and then all of a sudden they lost it. So it seems whatever love that they had had for Jesus was somehow gone. What, what happened? And I guess it probably started when someone said, Wow, well, isn't he the son of Mary and Joseph? We know them. How is it he can speak this way? One person, sometimes, making a comment can now influence all those other folks. And now, they're not listening in wonder anymore while he's sitting in the synagogue. They're all ready to drive him off the cliff that's at the edge of their town. He turns, though, and he walks through, through the midst of them. Not magic. They suddenly, at least some of them, realized what was happening, and that maybe their behavior wasn't exactly what it ought to be. And so he walked right past and away from them. So now I, I, I wonder, how much love was actually in Nazareth at the time? Uh, did Jesus know that this was not uh, the kindest, most loving community, even though he had spent three decades with them? I guess it's really hard when you find out that someone in your midst is not what you expected them to be. I kind of imagined this week as I was thinking about these scriptures, what would it be like for a, a reporter to then interview the people of Nazareth that day? 
uh, well, I just, I just went along with what the crowd was doing. We've heard that one before. You don't have to take any personal responsibility. It was all of them, and I just kind of followed along, kind of checking things out. Or someone might have said, well, they really wouldn't have hurt him because he was one of them. Another way of pushing away any kind of personal connection with what happened, it, it, was, it was they, they who did it, and they really wouldn't have done any of those, anything really horrible. Or they might have said, oh, well, he was speaking heresy. Man, he was saying stuff, uh, you know, that was in the scripture, and he probably shouldn't have been saying that stuff. That's heresy. And so we now say that uh, this thing that Jesus had said is now heresy. And so we've now put a, a label on it so that we have a right to go after him. And we're now justified with whatever our behavior is. Or they might have said, well, you know, Jesus was, was insulting his parents by acting like that in front of us and by saying those things. Oh, that's always a good excuse. Blame the victim. There's a whole lot of different ways you can blame the victim because you could just say, well, he, he, if, if he, he'd have been okay if he had just shut up. Yes, it was Jesus' fault, and I participated in doing something that I probably would have regretted. But I did it because, well, you know, those words just made me so mad. And then, well, you can ask, well, why, why, did, why, why did you, Jesus, why didn't you do for us what you did for all those other people in Capernaum and all those other towns? You know, those, those miracles we heard about, why weren't you doing that for us? So the excuse of jealousy and resentment. Again, blaming Jesus for not being what we want him to be, but then he couldn't be what we wanted him to be because we, we wanted him to be just like us and stay in our little town and do the things that the people in our town do, which is not such a bad thing, but maybe it's not for everybody. And I can't help but wonder also what, what it was like for Jesus' family staying back in Nazareth after all this happened. Pretty, pretty tough. I'm guessing that you recognize some of those excuses that people, we, give for all kinds of things that we've done or participated in or ignored or let pass. Because taking responsibility for what we need to do is not always very comfortable. In fact, it's really tough. Because sometimes we just go along because it's easier. It, it, it works because we don't have to be out there. We don't have to be the one that says, whoa, what are we doing? This is, this is not okay. Or, you know, we really love this person. Why are we doing this? What gives us the right to do this? And so it seems to me we know what can happen when even Christians, loving, caring Christians, forget about love for a time. We've seen it throughout our history. We have seen it in the crusades that happened, in the religious wars, the inquisition, the ghettoization of Jewish people, the pogroms, the witch hunts, the, the Holocaust, the genocides, the exclusion acts. We've seen it over and over again. And yet it keeps happening because we forget. We forget that love has to be at the center of who we are and what we do, as hard as it is. And I'm suspecting those people of Corinth who aren't too thrilled with getting Paul's note about how everybody's part of the body and that love is the greatest thing. You can have faith. You can have hope, but if you don't have the love, you don't have the whole peace. But here's the other side of it, because you can get really bogged down in all the negativity. 
Christian people in every one of those cases that I mentioned where love had been forgotten, there were Christian people who jumped in to try to help, to make things better, to stop. It didn't always work to try to stop the people. And so folks did step in. They tried to save their neighbor. When the temptation to do harm happened, there were Christians who stepped forward, who said, this is not right. This is not how we act. This is not what love does for us. We have known Christians through history who have put their lives on the line to help care for people who were sick. Back then, there were no vaccines. And yet, in the Middle Ages, and even in more contemporary times, when the plague hit, there were people who stepped up to care for the people who were sick, knowing that their own lives would be at risk. And we have it right now during our COVID experiences. The people working in hospitals over time, in situations and conditions that, that most of us would not be able to manage, and yet here they are doing the work. And they're there day after day. That's love, people. No matter what you want to call it, that's what it is. Oh, yeah, we may pay because people have to live, but that's love. And then we've had people all throughout history who are the peacemakers and the peacekeepers. The one who helped, ones who helped to keep us from rushing off to war when we get mad or resentful or we're scared. We have had Christians rescuing people who were at risk of death. And they did it at their own risk. And some of them did not survive. And yet we know what they did and how they helped people. People they didn't know, total strangers, not of their own group, not of their own race or gender or whatever other category you want to put people in. There have been Christian people standing right up and doing the work, the work of love. We have parents and grandparents here whose love has enabled their children to grow up to be unbelievably amazing people, to remember to love other human beings and the creation. That's amazing. That really is. We have people who have stood up for human rights at all levels, although they may have been cursed or chased down or lynched or had all kinds of horrific things, it did not stop Christians from helping. And so I think something that we all should be considering doing this week is, is rereading Corinthians 1, 1 Corinthians 1, 13, and just, just read it through again and then commit ourselves to do a little bit of love spreading. Because we need a lot of it right now. We got a lot of polarization going on. We have a lot of people who don't want to hear what anybody else's point of view is, or have already decided who the evil ones are and who are the good ones. And you know what? We need a little love spreading going on here. And this week is a really good time to try it because it's a little snowy and a little bit cold and all of that stuff. And we could warm not only ourselves, but the people around us up by putting in there a little bit of love in what we do, in what we say, how we think. Because love has to be at the center. And we need to need to do love. We need to, because it's part of who we are as Christians through our commitment and through our command by Jesus to love God and love our neighbors and ourselves. And so let's try it this week. Let's, let's see how much love spreading we can do and then see what we can do from there because you know what? It's about love. Amen.
please rise for our uh, UCC statement of faith. We believe in you, O God, eternal spirit, God of our Savior Jesus Christ, and our God, and to your duty to testify. You call the worlds into being, create persons in your own image, and set before each one the ways of life and death. You seek his holy love to share all people from hopelessness and sin. You judge people and nations by your righteous will, declared through your prophets and apostles. In Jesus Christ, our sin and Nazareth, you're crucified and you're saved as the You have come to us and share our common lot, conquering sin and death, and reconciling the world to yourself. You bestow upon us your Holy Spirit, Creating and renewing the Church of Jesus Christ, binding covenant and faithful people of all ages, tongues, and races. You call us into your Church to accept the cross and joy of discipleship, to be your servants in the service of others, to proclaim the gospel to all the world, and resist the powers of evil, to share in Christ's baptism and eat at His table, to join Him in His passion and victory. You promise to all who trust you forgiveness of sins and fullness of grace, courage, courage in the struggle for us and peace, your presence in trial and rejoicing, and eternal life in your realm, which has no end. Blessing and honor, glory and power be unto you. At this point, are there any uh, prayer requests that we would like to share among our community? I know uh, prayers are continue to be asked for uh, uh, Pastor Meyer, who was a, an interim pastor here for a while. She is now in rehab, uh, recovering from uh, cancer surgery. Are there, are there any others? Then let us come together to God in prayer. Holy God, thank you for this day and for bringing us here through the challenges of the snow and the weather. It is a great pleasure and privilege for us to be able to come together each Sunday to be with one another, to share our stories, and to share our love for one another. We ask for wisdom and for patience as we navigate the challenges of our days and our week. We ask for continued help when we need it, and in particular help for those who are suffering in their mind or body or spirit. Be with them and help them to find healing, to find relief, and to find peace. We also ask that you will be with all of those who are grieving, whether it's grieving for the small things, a loss of a home, or a loss of a job, or the large things, like the loss of a loved one, who was such an important part of our lives. Help all who are grieving to find new peace. And those who have lost precious ones, help them to find a time when they will remember their loved one with joy instead of only the pain of loss. We ask all of these things and so much more that you know we hold in our hearts. In the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us all to pray together, saying, Our Father, Father who art in heaven, 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 hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, our bread, and forgive and forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. And at this time, we get to celebrate the ability to give to others some of what we have been given in our lives. Remember, this uh, the end of January is uh, the end of our time for interfaith, but that doesn't mean we can't give to interfaith any time because we, we have supported them regularly for so many years. And our coming uh, 
and, and we will be having a new uh, EWU uh, finalist coming up for federal board, so be aware of that as well.
thank everybody who helped uh, with this service this morning, in particular Marty and Jim and Jim Gagliardi and uh, uh, Jeff for uh, getting us online, which is great. Thank all of you who've come and all of you who are out there in the, the ether of the, the, uh, the internet. Um, this, hopefully you'll be able to take something with you into this, uh, this week. We know what is required, required of us to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. Let us go from this place now, knowing that we are loved and supported by God, our Creator, Jesus Christ, our Savior, and the Holy Spirit, our sustainer and comforter.